Joining us now, the New York Times' Ben Smith, media columnist there for The Gray Lady. It's good to see you, Ben. Thank you for joining us. We really appreciate it. Yeah, thanks for having me. Congrats on the new show. Appreciate Thank you. Well, that's why we wanted to have you on. I actually remember one of my favorite columns, part of the thing that actually inspired this, was about the rise of new media. I think it was one of the second or third ones that you actually did there in the Times around about how people who are newly famous are famous to you, so to speak. Like, we have new rise of internet celebrities, not necessarily generally known to the public, but very well known to a select group. And at the same time, so we have media outlets like ours, you also have the thriving, really, of your own paper. What do you think that the juxtaposition of those two tell us about the media story that we're in right now? Um, yeah, I mean, I guess, as you described it, there are two big things going on. One is that, like, as in every, at least every digital industry, the biggest things are getting bigger, you know, Google and Facebook. And then, on, you know, on a much smaller scale in the news business, the New York Times, Disney and Netflix. I mean, and it's, you know, and what used to be a landscape in news of, you know, dozens and dozens of big metropolitan newspapers is now um, this, you know, is now increasingly just a couple of giant players. And then almost inevitably at the same time, lots of new small stuff is, is springing up in the cracks in the sidewalk. And people, there's a new sort of technical ability, which you are doing to reach, mm -hmm. reach an audience directly and charge them. What is the assessment or analysis or feeling within those larger organizations? And what is the term of art you prefer? Elite media, legacy media, corporate media? You probably don't say corporate media, <laughs> but what I, I would be interested to know your term of art for that space that we're talking about. What is the assessment and feeling there about the rise of people on Substack, platforms like ours, other institutions that are sort of coming from the grassroots up? Is there awareness of it? Is there nervousness about it? Is there condescension, contempt towards it? What do you, what's your assessment there? Well, for, for, for my own purposes, I would say mostly contempt. <laughs> <laughs> yes, just speaking personally. Yeah, right. right. Pers personally, yeah. No, um, I mean, honestly, these, these big institutions are doing really well. Like, I don't think there's any sense at the Washington Post or the Times of sort of panic about Substack, right? I mean, these, are, these institutions are really thriving using the same kind of digital subscription businesses. I mean, I think the folks who are panicked are the kind of medium-sized players, the regional newspapers, the um, kind of medium-sized websites that yeah. are seeing on one hand that, that you know where where their you know where their most successful employees are you know either going to go work somewhere really big or go out, strike out on their own and I think it's very hard to hold those kind of like middle spaces right now. Mm. Um, I mean I do think in the big newsrooms there there is a real tension around essentially on one hand there's this new push for kind of egalitarianism through the labor movement and for a sense that everything that salaries in particular should be and work you know nobody should be working too much harder than anybody else nobody should be being paid that much more than anybody else. And then on the other, there is just this reality that somebody who is more of a star, whether because they work harder or because they are more popular for whatever re ever reason, can just leave and make way more money. And so, Ben, this is what I'm curious from your perspective, which is that, is this good or bad for journalism? Because, look, I mean, we'll be honest, like, in terms of news gathering and all of that, I haven't seen anybody do it yet quite the right way from a subscription model. So I know that there is a new Substack, I believe, correspondent at the, new, at the White House, who now has a hard pass, who has a Substack, Hunter Walker, formerly of Yahoo News, oh, but in turn, it was brand new. I think it literally Sirota's just happened. Got David Sirota's got the Daily effort. Poster. There's a few elements at actual news gathering and reporting, but few and far between amongst many of the Substack literati or even frankly amongst shows like ourselves. So what do you think that means for the future of actual journalism, which is something I came up in and care a lot about? Well, I mean, first of all, I'd say, you know, opinion is a form of actual journalism. Sure. Don't, don't sell yourself short. Um, interviews, you know, like this one. Your, um, your utter contempt for us aside. <laughs> executive reporting, the kind of reporting that takes a while and might not pay off, that isn't going to generate an, an email every day, that isn't necessarily going to tell the audience what they want to hear every day, doesn't fit so easily inside this kind of subscription model and does, you know, is the core, I think, right now of, of what makes a place like the New York Times essential to subscribe to. It's not that it'll tell you what happened yesterday. It's that it'll have huge revelations about key stories. 
-hmm. Our strategy has been to make sure some segment of our audience hates us every day, so yes. sort of like equal right. opportunity in that way. <laughs> um, ben, I also wanted to ask you about New York City politics. Um, because you uh, came up in that world, you know it better than than almost anyone. What's kind of your assessment of where the New York City mayoral race is right now? And I also want to ask you in a minute about your column about Anthony Weiner, which is quite <laughs> fascinating too. I mean, you know, the interesting thing is that there is this sense, I think particularly among black New Yorkers who are a huge part of the Democratic primary electorate, that safety is the key, is the biggest issue. That you uh -huh. know, shootings are way up. That there's a sense in Manhattan, at least, of kind of, and, and of, of kind of a disorder that comes from a lot of offices still being abandoned. Um, so a lot of like the, I guess, more kind of white liberal Manhattan voters feel it there. Um, and so a race that everybody thought a year ago was going to be about police reform and about kind of pushing the progressive envelope is is about. Um, has become a race about gun, you know, about cracking down on guns. And the leading right. candidate, an ex-cop who's promising a sort of, you know, reformist law and order platform. And it was fascinating to me, Ben. I remember your column on Andrew Yang. What did you? There was a lot of original takes around Yang coming in, the outsider candidate, and more. He's become probably more conventional as the race, as the course has moved on within the race. From a media perspective, but also just the way that you've observed him, what do you make of his candidacy and what do you think it actually means to New York City politics? Like, is it the actual death of the machine or is the machine actually still pretty powerful in the end? You know, the death of the machine was like 30 years ago and people <laughs> talk about the urban machines and there are places where they matter, but the sort of machine hasn't really elected a mayor. I mean, maybe since David Dinkins, but he who also had a lot of other stuff going on in his favor. Um, and so, so I think, yeah, I mean, you know, yeah, I mean, in some ways, you know, Rudy Giuliani and Mike Bloomberg have been mayor for most of the last 20 years. And so the last 30 years. And so the notion of kind of a charismatic outsider is, is kind of more in keeping with um, the way New York is run than the notion of kind of a hacky Democrat. Interesting. Um, yeah. But yeah, I mean, I think Yang's appeal was there's this sense that the city's coming back, that there's there's this broad sense of optimism that is competing with a freak out about crime. And I think he sort of speaks to that. But also part of the problem is, you know, his big idea is, is printing money and giving it away. The city can't print money. The constraints of, of local policy and a kind of administrative job with a balanced budget are just narrow. Like there's not, it's, there's not that much space for innovation. There's a lot of space for kind of really, really good administration. And so I think there's a sense that voters are looking for that and Yang has no experience. Uh -huh. Yeah. And then do you see this as kind of a classic like left in disarray <laughs> type of, of a narrative too? Because you had uh, Diane Morales positioned herself as sort of like the leftiest candidate in the race. And now that campaign seems to have imploded. Her staff workers are abandoning her. They wanted to form a union. They marched on her own headquarters. Then old interviews emerged, old by which I mean like a year ago, in which she's backing Cuomo over Cynthia Nixon and embracing a lot of not very progressive policies. Um, Scott Stringer hit by uh, two different sexual harassment or sexual assault allegations, both of which I would say, you know, nobody knows what happened there, but there are some holes, significant holes in the stories of, of both of the women making these allegations. But that didn't stop the progressive movement from completely abandoning him. Now you have an attempt to coalesce around Maya Wiley, but it's so late in the game at this point, where if you had had one candidate who was like the clear choice of the left, do you think that they might have had a fighting shot at actually winning the mayoral race? Or are these safety concerns just too primary for that to have even worked out in this cycle? I think it's a good question. I mean, I think if, if AOC had run, you know, would would she be winning right now? I think, mm. I don't know. I mean, I think Maya Wiley is a pretty strong candidate. There is this, you know, a, a Diane Morales' campaign collapsed just in the most spectacular fashion I've ever seen, right? I mean, it was really it just devoured itself. Um, and I think really not only did it, you know, destroy the this kind of that that corner of the left chances in this race, but I think made the sort of whole New York political universe at least think, wow, these people can't, you know, you can't let them near your campaign, right? <laughs> like this, this sort of internal disarray that was just kind of spectacular to watch. Yeah. Yeah, although I think a lot of those staffers, at least some of them, moved over to the Wiley campaign, which is interesting, too. Um, you have a great and fascinating column up right now about Anthony Weiner. We can actually throw that tear sheet up on the screen. 
What made you want to write about him? What was it that you wanted to, to dig into or think about with Anthony Weiner? Um, I mean, you know, partly I'm just obsessed with the mayor's race, honestly, and was looking for an excuse to, to write about it. But you know, he's a guy, <laughs> you know, I, I had covered him for years, played a minor role in his political collapse. And, and I think that when you get, you know, when you're at the bottom of the media pile, you do develop an interesting perspective on, on, on media. I mean, he's a guy whose career, I don't think he's, you can't rehabilitate him. He's a convicted sex offender. Um, and yet also, on the other hand, you know, he went, unlike a lot of people who've been in Twitter jail, he was in federal prison for 18 months. Uh -huh. And so there's just this question of what do you do with somebody like that that kind of interests me. Oh, it's fascinating. Well, we encourage everybody to go and read it. Ben, we really appreciate you joining us our first week here at Breaking Points. Thanks very much. Thanks, Ben. Yeah, congratulations. Good to see you. Appreciate Thanks, Ben. It. Thanks, everybody, for watching Breaking Points. We really appreciate it. As you guys know, we are 100% powered by Supercast for our premium members. If you want to go ahead and check that out, it's right down there in the description link. You get to watch the show one hour early, completely uncut. Listen to it uncut as a podcast as well. And you really help us dial in some of the issues around here. Running a high-end TV production actually turns out it's really hard, it's Crystal. A, it turns out there um, are a lot of things we didn't know about when we were things. just like sitting there being talent. Decibel <laughs> levels, desk design, which some of us have mastered. And by the way, guys, uh, we, um, yeah. we have been paying attention to your comments. So yes, we appreciate please. the feedback because we want to continue to improve and up our game. This That's isn't right. like a static situation where we're just, this is what it is and we're going to continue in this vein. I want but, people to know that, which is like, yeah. look, we had no idea how this was going to work out. We put, put our own money on the line here around the set and the desk and a lot the studio and the crew that we had to hire and everything this is v1 and so your support makes it so that we can have continuous improvement and things are only getting started here and i am so so excited thank yeah. you all to the premium members lifetime members especially. can i also just say yeah. premium members yesterday yeah. got a little treat with a little bonus That's outtake right. an intentional right. bonus outtake of yeah. yours which they seem you to really enjoy curse. yeah guys, you guys really <laughs> you, you want to know the behind the scenes <laughs> magic it's me being like god damn it i Dr. mean <laughs> normally we're perfect yeah. that was just a really rare instance where we weren't absolutely perfect on the first date right. but yeah yeah all right so <laughs> congratulations <laughs> welcome to the uh welcome to what it really looks like mm -hmm. back here whenever the the cameras turn off. We appreciate you guys so much. We love you. Thank you all. And thank you to everybody. If you can help us out, become a premium subscriber right down there in the link. Thank you to Supercast and the DC Bar Studio for allowing us to produce this all here. Yep. And we will see you all on Thursday. Yep. Thanks, guys. See you on Thursday.